We have about just under 10 minutes for questions, so if anybody has a question, please raise your hand, and a roving mic will throw itself in your direction. <laughs> There's somebody over to the right, I think. Uh, hello? Is it on? Hello? Hello? <laughs> One, two. Hello? Hi, you're uh, on. Sorry, we're getting sorry. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm Sinead from MTU. Um, Melissa, I just want to say thank you for this presentation. It was fantastic. And uh, your, your point about reuse and, re and reusing these digital technologies, um, we know that. But I would be interested if you have any strategies or any positive stories of convincing academic staff to make these part of the curriculum uh, that so they're not quite so scared of them. <laughs> I do. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been doing open education resources for many years, and we have, yeah, good stories from within the curriculum, particularly where people have said, oh, I don't think I could add that in. So I'll give you an example from the medical school and the LGBT curriculum in the medical school and the students felt that there wasn't enough reflection of the experience of LGB people in taught in the curriculum at the University of Edinburgh Medical School. It's a very fancy established medical school. Um, but the particular colleague was saying, well we're not an it's not an, I'm not an expert in that area. That would take me quite a lot of time to write something and put it in. I said, well let's let's just have a wee search and see if there are any Anywhere else in the world, uh, there might have been a funded project to develop uh, this kind of material. Um, and uh, yeah, amazingly, there was. And of course, it's had you know a Mellon Foundation grant on it, and it's been uh, published as open educational resources, and it's available for adaptation and reuse. Admittedly, it's from America. So what you do is you take that, and this is what happened. Uh, they took it, and um, they rejected it and thought about it for the Scottish context and the students <coughs> rewrote it and so you then got the sort of comparative example and the students had a discussion about how these issues would be different in Scotland with the uh, legal and policy environment. But a big chunk of the content came straight from the work that had been done by that other project. And actually this is a case study that we use a lot because the student, it gets reused every year and updated and shared and it's shared back because it's under a shared alike license. And so anybody else can also reuse this material. So it's in the curriculum in the University of Edinburgh. It started somewhere else, but it's been adapted and shared locally. And the fact that it was available under an open license meant that there was no problem sharing it. And of course, the people who funded it the first time and the group of academics who wrote that the first time were delighted to know the university about it. You know, they'd been waiting for someone to use it because someone had funded it and they'd put all that effort into putting the licensing on it. So it's rude not to. <laughs> I also do have a whole um, website full of examples that I'm very happy to, to share. Um, but I think the thing about helping faculty to do this is to make it as easy as possible. It's our job is to lower the barriers. And when I say that we support it with, with services and policy and training, I, I mean that. I have an open educational resources team and they run a service and it's supported by university-wide policy. And we run, we run training and that makes it much easier to do. Uh, hi, uh, Melissa, thank you very much. Uh, Joanna Archibald from the Technological University of the Shannon in the Midlands, mouthful. Uh, but uh, my, my question is around data. Um, so one of the things that learning technologists, I think, uh, have more access to than librarians is the, 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 the VLE uh, and the, everything that comes with that in terms of what you're managing and, as you say, all the content and everything like that. Could you comment, particularly in kind of pre-post-COVID, um, could you comment on um, what you do with the kind of data and thinking about it from a, a, a kind of a strategy of engagement perspective or a kind of a, another way of looking at student uh, engagement? Uh, and secondly, maybe whether you've noted uh, a, a kind of more of an interest from very senior leaders looking at this and looking to get into that learning analytic space or to be much more... Um, evidence-based in, uh, in terms of some of the decisions that are being made around that sort of space as well. So, that's Yeah, um, yeah, there is an enormous amount of 
data held in your in your VLE. What's important is that you have data stewards and that you know who owns that data and you don't let it leaking out onto, it's no reason to give your data to Blackboard or such. Keep it in your own institution and use it um, as you need. But also, the number of approaches we get from keen AI researchers who think it will just be easy peasy for me to give them all of my data so that they can do work on the data to learn how people to understand how people learn. Learning analytics is actually something different again. I mean, actually, in order to, to do learning analytics, which would be around understanding how people learn, you'd have to have an understanding of how people learn. I'm not absolutely sure that that understanding as to what data you would even be looking at to know how people learn. So it might be different activity data and engagement data might be different from learning analytics. So we always have to be asking these um, questions. So we have done a number of uh, sort of experiments and projects around learning analytics, but they do tend to end up being activity and engagement data, you know, how much time the students are spending with things, but that doesn't mean they're learning them. It might just be that it's really difficult to download. Or they're watching it and watching it back again. Uh, I mean, for me, the m most interesting data is in the um, recorded lectures. It's in the media management system. So the speed they're watching things at, the, the which lectures they're watching and re-watching, and what time of the day and what time of the year they're watching and re-watching, and the things that they're going back to again and again. Is that the most complicated one, or is that the, the, the one that you know, was the introductory methods uh, course? And giving that feedback to the faculty who do know what the content is. And that's where it's most useful, is, to, is faculty engaging with the data about their learning resources. But yes, you're absolutely right. Senior management quite keen to make quite big decisions based on these um, pieces of data. And so we do have something called learning analytics um, principles and policy, which do state about how the university will use data and whether or not it can be used to make decisions about progression or marks or assumption, making assumptions about students because what you want to avoid is black box algorithms and that's actually what a lot of the commercial companies will be trying to sell you a solution whereby you give them all the data from your services they put it into a black box algorithm usually about retention and then whiz you out a dashboard that tells you who's most at risk. And actually what we find is that the academic faculty who are engaging with their students and having regular personal tutoring meetings with them had already spotted most of this. Um, and they, they, you know, we showed them and they say, I, I, I could have told you that. I think we have time for one more. Hi, Melissa. I'm Emma Good from NUI Goy. That was a fantastic keynote, as was yesterday morning's one as well, Chris. I just have one question to ask. It's in relation to the slides that you were showing due to time limitations, you weren't able to discuss all points. And one of the points was about women in red on your Wikimedia in one. Could you talk about that a little bit more, please? Yes, indeed. And you're very welcome to join us every month, usually Friday afternoons. We do Women in Red um, Wikimedia Editathons, where we all come together now online and we edit. Wikipedia together. It's called uh, Women in Red, uh, partly because it's monthly, that's a girl joke, uh, partly because um, if there's a name of a person who doesn't have a page yet, it will be, the link will be, will be red. If you put the page there, it becomes blue. So we're turning links from, from red to blue. Um, so Wikipedia is about 20, 21 years old. And when people talk about technology, democratizing. Wikipedia was supposed to democratize the publishing and the um, building of information. It was supposed to be open to the world. It was founded on these principles. And yet, you know this, less than 20% of the people who edit Wikipedia, who contribute to Wikipedia, are women, which means that the content is skewed. And we must tackle that. We can't let another area of technology emerge. And not, women know stuff. There's absolutely no reason. OK, there are reasons. But they're the same structural reasons that were reflected in whole swathes of technology and whole swathes of publishing. Who gets published? What knowledge is considered notable enough? Who is considered notable enough? Who cites who? Whether you can see who wrote a thing? 
it, Wikipedia mirrors that much larger um, publishing environment. So we must take, make an effort to ensure that the women, the young women in our organization know that they are allowed to, they are, support, they are absolutely allowed to contribute um, and participate. And they don't have to edit on pages about women. Shockingly, women know about all kinds of topics. <laughs> but the discussions that go on behind Wikipedia, even in the community of editors, a lot of people don't see that community of editors and the fights that we have about what's notable, what gets deleted, how people behave when they decide about things and delete other people's stuff. So we must arm our students with the confidence students and researchers, the confidence to engage in these communities. We cannot let this go on. And if you would like to join us on any given Friday, we will be very happy to see you. It's usually the last Friday of the month. It's, they're called Wikimedia in Red. We do them from the University of Edinburgh. We also do them, uh, uh, Women in Red events happen all the time. It's not specific to Edinburgh, but we now on our 60th, 65th, monthly Women in Red at the thon. Come and, come and join. And we will train you from the start. My Wikimedia in residence is a saint. He's a gem. You all should have one. As long as you don't have one, I've got a unique selling point at University of Edinburgh. <laughs> I've got a Wikimedia in residence. But I really don't understand why you don't all snap them up. Because I think um, they do really interesting things. To the question about open educational resources in the curriculum as well, we have five um, degree courses who have Wikimedia activities assessed, Wikimedia activities embedded in the curriculum. This is information literacy curriculum activities embedded and assessed in the curriculum. And that holy grail of getting information literacy in the curriculum has partly come around because of people's interest in Wikimedia and what that could possibly what that could possibly be. So again, I have a whole raft of information about that kind of thing. So we've got time again. Thank you very much. So folks, again, I'd like to thank Melissa for a really engaging talk and to invite you to spread out and disperse for the next round of presentations starting in about four minutes. Thank you very much.